upload and the stream will be a little bit smoother. Uh, like I said last time, we live out in the country, so we have country slow internet, that's for sure. But we are here for the first ever uh, installment of the Dragonfly Pair Lunchtime Book Club. And we decided to start off with What Happened to You by Bruce Perry and Oprah Winfrey. Uh, and with the um, just chapter one on the list to discuss today. So, um, yes, so here we are. Uh, I will say that this book kind of hits you right. Um, a lot comes at you pretty quick uh, from Oprah's personal story, that's for sure, uh, as well as the, the science, the background um, for kind of how our brains process the information that we receive, especially as young kids, uh, when we don't quite have the verbal articulation to get it out. So that's kind of my first thought was, man, this, uh, this is going to be a good book. It's going to be heavy, but it's going to be uh, filled with a lot of good information and I think elicit a lot of good discussion and um, responses. So kind of just getting into Oprah's introduction, uh, not only kind of the trauma that she experienced um, just as a young child, but I liked her perspective of it, certainly at least talking with Dr. Perry, um, getting down to the why, um, why what happens to us, what we do, uh, how we feel and how we act. Uh, and if you're wondering, looking down because I have my notes, uh, I'm a note taker and uh, got to keep it all, keep it all straight because uh, there's information in this first chapter. Anyway, um, another thing she mentioned just in her introduction um, from her discussions with Dr. Perry was that, I'll just read it here, that the effects of my treatment by those who were supposed to care for me weren't strictly emotional, there was also a biological response. Uh, I found that interesting because um, a lot of times I think when we experience traumatic things in our lives, um, bad things happen, we kind of keep it all up here in our brains. Um, but our body, you know, our body holds score, it, it keeps score. Uh, you can't really separate the mind from the body, right? Uh, it's, it's one and the same. So I'm interested in seeing how that will uh, continue to play out in the book as we go along. Quick side note, uh, when I read that bit, I um, happened to just listen to Dak Shepard's podcast, uh, his uh, armchair expert. He did an episode with Perry. And no, it's not all about the drama that surrounds Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, but it's about uh, mental health and specifically Prince Harry's work with Oprah on a new television series that they have. But they actually touch on that, that the body stores up uh, and learns how to adapt to all the trauma that we go through uh, and experience throughout our lives. So I just thought that was a little side note if you happen to listen to him or um, maybe have listened to his stuff before, check out the episode with Prince Harry. It was really good. All right. So um, back to the biological response, you know, I'm learning how the brain responds to the traumas and stress that we have in our lives ends up shaping our behaviors and what we do. Um, and again, just will be interesting to see how, what other scientific information we end up getting as the book goes along. Moving into Dr. Perry's introduction, I liked his approach with explaining the science through shared stories. Um, especially when we get into talking about brain science and it can get pretty high and dense and a lot of big words. Um, but I think we can all relate to shared experiences. The traumas I experienced as a child, maybe not the same as yours, but we can all come together from that, that shared experience of having gone through something um, that wasn't necessarily good. So I like that approach and um, it'll be curious again as we get further along to see um, what other stories that we get. 
um, and he touches on at the very end uh, of his introduction about kind of the title, how they got into the, you know, what happened to you versus what's wrong with you. Um, and I like that, but I did share last time how the title itself, you know, what happened to you was kind of a trigger for me because as a, a child born with a and cleft lip, that's all I was ever asked. Um, you know, what happened to you? And although it's kind of, you know, a bit of a trigger, um, I'm, I guess, interested in seeing how I go uh, and evolve and kind of put some of that, that trauma trigger away uh, when I hear the phrase, you know, what happened to you? I do think it's interesting when he mentioned about shifting, shifting the words, when you come up to someone and you say, what's wrong with you? You know, it kind of elicits that defensiveness um, right from the get-go. You have to somehow explain yourself. Um, but whereas if someone were to ask genuinely, you know, what happened to you? You kind of relax your shoulders a little bit. You get the feeling that they're coming to you with a genuine interest in wanting to understand you more, try to help, uh, something like that. I just kind of noticed my body response uh, when I was reading that. It's like, oh, you know, when someone comes at you with, you know, what's wrong with you? It's like, oh, I don't think I really want to want to share that. Um, so anyway, let's move into chapter one. So I kind of broke it down, at least in my um, approach to talk with you, um, between Oprah's take and Dr. Perry, and I know at least in this first chapter, they go back and forth uh, in their conversation. Um, so I'm going to be uh, looking at that and just go um, going at it um, from that perspective. I'm sorry, I'm uh, trying to figure out, just not missing anybody's comments, but I don't think think anybody said anything yet so that's all right I have lots of things that I can talk about so <laughs> anyway uh, so chapter one on page 22 specifically um, Oprah talks about how you know experiencing trauma as a child at least um, in this passage can create like a deep longing that the child will search and continue to try to fill um, even as they go into their adult life, if that, you know, if that initial trauma or that longing is not met and satisfied, you know, in a positive, in a positive way. Um, she specifically says that as the children grow, they lack the ability to set a standard for what they deserve. And if that lack is not addressed, what often follows is a complicated, frustrating pattern of self-sabotage, violence, promiscuity or addiction. And I mean, I think she just hits the nail on the head there, um, just from my own experience. Um, just as a child growing up in a small town, I'd say initially, you know, I was teased. Um, there was a, a select few that were pretty regular with it. But again, being in a small town, you know, you're growing up with everybody. You're there together. You're going through first all the way to high school together. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of people leave and come back. So kind of the, the novelty of teasing me, you know, the novelty of the girl with weird face wears off. And it just kind of goes away. Um, but then cut to graduating high school and college. I went to the University of Oregon. And just as perspective, my high school in total was 500 kids. My first introduction to chemistry class at the University of Oregon was 500 kids. So, fish out of water, um, real big culture shock for me. I wasn't living on campus, I was still living at home. Um, but that just brought back all of that, you know, nervousness, anxiousness, wanting to fit in, wanting to blend in, not wanting to stand out. Um, Again, as a girl with a weird face. Um, so I turned to alcohol. I had never really drank at all in high school. 
but then in college, right, you get invited to parties um, and try to make friends and make myself feel more comfortable, relaxed, then I started drinking. Um, but what I didn't know that I was doing at the time, I mean, I know now, was that I was just setting myself up for this pattern of behavior, this kind of self-soothing that every time I feel uncomfortable, don't want to stand out, you know, and then, then I would turn to alcohol as the thing that would make me relax and not worry about that stuff anymore, make me feel like I was just like everybody else. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and if any of you have any thoughts or uh, something you'd like to share, I'd like to read the comments on that. Um, and I guess, you know, what she says as well is that every moment builds upon it. And not, you know, you can't just compartmentalize. We, we may want to, but everything that we do, especially in terms of trying to self-soothe or heal trauma or be strong or what have you, it just builds another layer, you know, on top of that one, on top of that one, until we sometimes even forget where it all began. So I thought that was a, an interesting take. And I do love her last line uh, on page 22. And if we want to understand the oak, it's back to the corn we must go. And uh, I like that. I thought, well, that's kind of, you know, saying, but you got, you know, another way of saying you've got to do the work. So let's see what Dr. Perry has to say. Uh, for him, you know, of course, he's coming at it from the, the true, you know, scientific background and explaining behaviors through the lens of the brain, uh, as Oprah says. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting and then also um, very relatable to anybody that has been around young children um, that one of the things he mentions, at least on page 28, is that when you activate the stress response, that the systems in the higher parts of the brain get shut down. Uh, and it kind of made me chuckle because if you've ever dealt with a young child throwing a tantrum you know, having a hissy fit, whatever you want to call it, you know that there's no, there's no negotiating. There's no talking them down until they're ready to calm down. Because that top, you know, executive function of the brain is not, it's not working. It's, it's done. Um, whatever they're experiencing is going on, you know, in the bottom, in the lower brain, or I think they call it the reptilian brain. Um, so I thought that was, you know, Interesting and also relatable. Um, we've all been there with our own children or seeing, you know, seeing kids in a grocery store. The mom's trying to calm the kids down. Um, it can be very difficult, if not impossible, to do when they're at the throes of that high, high response. Um, and the other thing that he mentions as he keeps going here uh, on page 31 um, near the bottom there, that the experiences in the first years of life are dispropor disproportionately powerful in shaping how your brain organizes. Um, and that got me thinking to my own experience, you know, in my young life with my surgeries. Um, I had my first surgery before I was six months old, um, and it didn't stop until I was um, almost 14. Um, and I'm reading my notes here because uh, I wrote it all down. But thinking about how at that young of an age, being poked and prodded, you know, needles and cut upon and having my arms, you know, held down on the, on the gurneys because, of course, you know, a kid wants to go to where the pain is, um, set me up to kind of reject anything that has to put myself in that kind of vulnerable position as I got older, when I finally had more to say in what was going on with me, which is why I think at my last surgery around eighth grade, any other surgery that I was going to get was going to be purely cosmetic. Um, and I just said, no, I'm done. Because I just had enough uh, of having things happen to me. Um, and especially, you know, that cause physical and emotional. So now, you know, it's thinking about, okay, at that age, 
you know, even at that young age, you start putting up walls, building up armor. How am I going to get through this? You know, and then the minute you have a choice, at least for me, I was out. I'm just, I'm not going to deal with that anymore. Um, and I wonder if any of you have had that kind of experience. If you think, you know, as you were reading this chapter, when you were young, was there something that would regularly occur, you know, did occur, and you can kind of trace it back where, well, gee, you know, now I don't, I don't really like, you know, going to the doctor and I don't really like going to the dentist and not just kind of the, I don't want people's hands in but, you know, is there more to it than that? Uh, what kind of, you know, when you feel your body react in a way, there's something, you know, there's something else going on. Um, he kind use uh, a bit with that on page 34 as that associations or memories are being created in the lower networks uh, of the brain and this has a huge impact on how trauma is stored in the brains of the very young so again kind of turning it uh, turning it back to myself as I was reading this it really made a lot of sense not only just for the surgery aspect um, but when it comes to the dentist. Now, I know a lot of people don't like the dentist anyway. Um, but for me, I, when I was young, I had some pretty traumatic experiences with one particular dentist. I won't name names. I don't, I don't even know if he's still alive. He, he's ancient when I was all of eight years old. But anyway, not the best bedside manner. Pretty rough. Uh, with a child with a, a cleft lip and palate there was a lot going on um, and it was really you know traumatic and so just kind of giving you a little bit of um, insight I guess how it can carry on into adult life just a few years ago I had to have some more work done um, and as I was just sitting upright in the chair speaking to my new dentist not the old dentist uh, new dentist about what I was needing to have done, what I wanted to have done, I just burst into tears, like inconsolable. Um, and I felt like I was eight years old again, thinking to myself, you know, crying out loud, get it together. You know, you're 41. Let's just suck it up here. But it has a lot to do with all of those traumas. From all of that that I mean even now when I go in for cleanings you know and the chair goes back and you're just like oh I have to tell myself I'm not eight I'm gonna be okay this is not like it was um, I have a voice now so trying to uh, remind myself of those techniques and tools uh, to help me feel a little bit better I just you know it shocked me kind of emotional response um, and not taking the time to really of course process it in the moment but uh, upon reflection yeah I, I, I was told again and having to go through the trauma of showing this new dentist that you know I don't have any of my real front teeth and you know all that kind of vulnerability is it's tough um, oh and just now getting into on page 37, uh, Dr. Perry said something that uh, I thought was just kind of funny. Um, he says, for most people, the unknown is one of the major causes of feeling anxious or overwhelmed. And immediately I'm thinking, yes, hello, 2020. We all experienced an entire year of fear of the unknown. Um, and think about what it did to you your body, your mind, how did you react? How did you feel? You know, in a way, kind of a good little case study on your own ways of handling that kind of trauma. And um, what do you do? You're, you're uncertain and you don't know what the outcome is going to be. Um, it can be eye-opening if you're willing to sit down and actually take a look at it. Um, it's not not always fun, but it will pay off in the long run for sure. So, I see two of you there. 
um, if you have anything that you'd like to share, I'd love to hear it. Um, just kind of, to me, that sort of, I mean, that's near the end of chapter one, uh, as it does. He talks a bit about uh, that particular uh, case study with the um, military veteran and PTSD, uh, and I thought that was a really good example um, of kind of in a, in, a, in a way that is very easy to understand. Um, but, it, you know, it had me go down the path of thinking about, okay, you know, what what are the things that I can recognize in my, my body's response, my emotional response now that might be, you know, having to do with something that happened uh, in the past. So, I'm just going to kind of sum up with my my takeaways from the first chapter here. I think overall what they're trying to say is if you really want to figure out why you're doing what you're doing, you have to get down to the why. You have to keep asking the question, why? Um, that trying to understand our behaviors and choices they can't be done unless we do that hard work. Um, and it actually feels comforting to me to know that, that there's a bit of science to it. Um, can kind of work it through um, somewhat objectively. Um, because I think in general, you know, we don't think about how we process our emotions or explaining our behaviors in that way. Uh, a lot of times I think we just think that we're just reacting to what's going on, um, which is sometimes true. Uh, but it does make me feel good that um, I have a scientific approach to that out. And instead of feeling like I have no control over my reactions or my feelings, that by doing the work and getting down to the why, it gives me that knowledge. It gives me that power to recognize, then understand, and then as a result, change that pattern. Um, and as Oprah says, to you know, reshape our lives. So it's not easy. None of this, none of this work is easy. But I think um, if you get some time and when you're upset about something that you've done, you reacted, flew off the handle, you know, whatever it may be, don't like your behaviors, you're choosing self-destructive habits, you know, ask yourself why, and not just the superficial, you know, why am I having a whole bottle of wine at night instead of just one glass? Well, because the bottle was on sale, it's one of my favorites, and I like it. Well, all right, but why? You know, and just keep going down that you get, get down to the crux of it. Um... And I think, at least from my own experience, um, it'll be worth it. You'll get the realization that, okay, this is not just something I have no control over. I can control my thoughts. I can control the feelings that they, my thoughts give me. And I can choose a better action as a result of those thoughts and feelings. So, I guess that's it. I've been talking for 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, we're moving on to chapter two next. I'm curious because I think it said, uh, seeking balance. So we'll see what that, that entails. If you haven't had a chance, uh, I've done some updates to, uh, the website. If you head over to dragonflyparadigm.com, um, looks a little prettier. Got some self-confidence tips for you. Uh, and if you like what you see, you can hit that subscribe link and get my uh, confidence building cheat sheet that has 10 uh, activities that you can do to boost up your self-esteem and self-confidence today. Um, I would appreciate it. And I don't think I see any comments, but that's all right. I will see you next Wednesday noon for chapter two. Have a good afternoon.